the studio uh, here in the studio in the UK. Nice early start. Um, I will be asking various questions. If people would like to answer these in chat, that is always cool. Um, makes me feel less as I'm speaking to the wall. Uh, if you want to put your videos on, again, you know, please do. I'd, nice to see happy smiley faces and, and, and try to keep them smiling. That's my, that's my objective. Um, but no, tell you in chat, can you just put a little, uh, put, put where you are in the world? Where are you in the world? Just type that in for me, that'd be cool. I'm near Nottingham. Nottingham, if you know Nottingham, it's where Robin Hood is from. So I'm a modern day Robin Hood. No, not really. So what have we got? Uh, lots of Dubai, Oman. Yes, I've been to Dubai, not been to Oman. Egypt, I've not been. Bahrain, no, no. Lebanon, Dubai, Riyadh. Yeah, I've worked in Riyadh a lot. Worked in Riyadh quite a bit. Saudi also. Nobody from Jeddah. Everyone in Jeddah is still partying, aren't they? They're watching the Formula One left yesterday. They're, they're, not, they're, they're too tired to come to this morning. Um, oh, no, what a brilliant, brilliant. Good. And while we're just doing the chat, could, we, could you put into chat also, what is your role? So are you a sales manager, sales director, VP sales? Are you a salesperson, a BDM, business development manager, CAM, sales engineer, BDM, sales director, software? Brilliant, GM, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Really good mix. Yeah, entrepreneur, it's everything. <laughs> um, no, that's cool. So um, I will try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, I will assistants who'll be looking as well. If there's any questions, what I will tend to do is pick up on those at the end. Though I do like to sort of keep an eye as we're going through as to uh, you know, what people are thinking. If there's any questions, Ask it while I'm talking so you don't forget. Uh, please do. Um, as I say, I'll ask a couple. Some are reflective. Some you might not want to answer, uh, certainly into chat, but please, please answer them in your head. You know, they're, they're designed to help you think. So uh, that's, that's cool. That is cool. I'm not going to ask you what the weather's like because the weather's going to be nice and it's not here. It's dark, it's cold, it's wet. It's all you need to know. So good, 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 good. Um, so yes, my name is Fred Copestake. I am founder of Brindis. Brindis is a sales training consultancy. Uh, and over the last 22 years, I've been around the world 36 times, uh, 14 times, worked in 36 countries, uh, trained over 10,000 salespeople. So I, I've been really blessed to be able to do that. And whilst I've been doing that, and certainly more recently, what I've noticed are that whatever sector, whatever country, uh, whatever area role almost you're working in, there are some very similar challenges. So I kind of categorize these into three main challenges. Uh, busy, 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 oldie worldy, and muddled mindset. And it's as a result of these and how we can address these and become more modern in selling that I wrote my book, Selling Through Partnering Skills. That addresses these challenges. What are the things that we as salespeople find difficult or um, challenging today. So I'm going to go through these. Let's just see whether these things are ones that affect you. See if you recognize these and I'll ask you at the end whether you're one, two, or whether you get a full house and it's three. Busy, busy, busy is all about when salespeople are running around doing lots and lots of things. They're being really active, really energetic. They're working very, very hard. But the point is the stuff they're doing isn't necessarily effective. Uh, so they actually waste quite a lot of time. They waste quite a lot of energy. Uh, they waste a lot of resource. So it's tiring for people. It's tiring. It's stressful. And you know, we know stress is not a good thing. Sales will become really unfocused. It's almost panic mode sometimes, rushing around doing all these things. And so we see this busy, busy, busy approach where when we get behind, we throw more at a problem, but without getting the results that can you know, send people into it. It's a quite a bad space. Another challenge that we see is oldie worldy. So this is old English, ye oldie worldy sweetie shoppy. And this is about being old fashioned. It's old fashioned in the way that you're trying to sell. Now, the way that we see this manifest itself is that often people are too self-centered. They talk about themselves, they talk about their product, they talk about their company. Um, they are just all about them. And the problem is customers aren't interested. Customers are interested in themselves. I sometimes see this where people are selling quite a technical product. 
they get way too detailed. They think that the way to impress people is to give them lots and lots of information, really technical, go down right into the weeds. But again, the problem is people think, I'm not bothered. I want to understand the results that I'm getting, the outcomes that I would achieve from working with you. Now, I can kind of forgive these because they often tend to be from, from passion, from enthusiasm. Um, the last one, which is poor practice, is where salespeople just using old fashioned techniques that once upon a time were trained because people thought they were a good idea. However, they're manipulative, they're poor practice, they're even unethical. And we see that some of these things are still pushed and they have no place in modern selling. And that's the problem, we need to delete these and we need to eliminate them. The third challenge we see is muddled mindset. That's where salespeople are confused. And this, this we can see often coming down from the top of the organization. And what happens goes something like this. The, organize, the organization says, we're consultative. We solve problems for customers. We're solutions focused. And everyone thinks this is excellent. Very, very good. However, that's for the majority of the month. At the end of the month, it's, oh, no, not made enough sales. Let's get out there. Let's push it. Um, let's try to get some sales. And it, it forces people to become more transactional. So the managers then get caught in the middle thinking, well, actually, am I supposed to be helping salespeople get better at sales and be more consultative in their approach? Or am I looking at a spreadsheet and trying to push people to get things and push them out the door that maybe customers don't even want? The individual is left in this really weird scenario where which one am I? I don't know what to do. And again, they get more confused, more tired, more stressed. So all these things kind of um, fit into each other. So just, uh, just as a quick one, again, you don't have to put a uh, comment into chat, but I'd love you to just think, are you one, are you two, are you three? Do you recognize these in yourselves or your, your organization? Um, Musa, I, so um, I see, I see it again. So what, why, uh, why have the practices, why have practices worked in the past? Because they were the things that people did. It's only when we realized that there was better things to do that they now were better. I'm going to go through an evolution of sales. So I think that'll answer your question far better. If you've got any more questions after that little section, just please, please pop it into chat. Yeah, Varen's a bit of all, bit of everything. Yeah, not, not desperately bad on all of them, but you do recognize little parts. Two, two out of three, mixed bag. <laughs> Absolutely mixed bag. Yeah, um, very, very common. People say, ah, maybe not as bad as you've said. I've painted quite a, a negative picture, but you'll say, ah, little bits of those. Yeah, I recognize those in myself. So question is, what are we going to do to fix them? How can we do stuff to make this go away? How can we address these challenges? So let's just go through this again, at a very high level. Busy, 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 we counter by being more effective. This is about preparation, planning, and using process. So prepare and think about where you're going to get the right business, what good business looks like, be ready to talk about stuff in a good way, and then plan to apply this in a way that's manageable within the day, within the week, the week, in the month. Have a good structure for the way to work. Think about the process that you use, so having good sales process, a methodology, a way to keep on track to keep the focus on the things that make a difference. That's how we counter the busy, busy, busy. We take far more control of what it is that we do. Yoldy worldy, so getting up to date, become more modern, we do by flip, follow and focus. So we flip where our, where our attention is. We flip it so we're talking about customers, we're talking about their business, their organization, their concerns, their outcomes, their results, it's all about them. If we feel we're too technical, again, we revert back to process that makes sure that we're following the things to do in the right sequence that are gonna make a difference. So that will help drive the customer focus. And if it's poor practice, it's really just focus on the stuff that works today. Stop doing the things that are old fashioned. Work on the things that are more modern and far more conducive for success today. So the muddle mindset, the organization needs to be clear. They need to say, this is how we work. This is what we do. This is the way we do it. Here's the support to do that. And this is how we want to move ahead. So management can then say, okay, this is good. We can now coach salespeople to work like this. We can spend time helping them get better. 
It's a key management job. And the salesperson can make decisions in the moment as to this is the right thing for us to do. This is how it works. This is what I do. This is the way the organization works and how I can be most effective. These are the things we need to do as modern salespeople. So a bit by myself, you know, why, why, why am I bothered about this? So you can hear I get quite passionate about it. Um, well, I've kind of always been in sales. My, my first job was in sales. I was eight years old, eight years old. And I worked in a Victorian mill. So I don't know if any of you have traveled to the UK. We have these big old fashioned mills from the industrial era. where lots of lots of people went to work. And we had a family business which happened to be based in that. We weren't mill owners, it was a builder's merchant. So we sold bricks and kitchens and bathrooms and tiles. And at Christmas one year in December, uh, I was eight years old, we had this sale. So it was a special offer part of the year. And I was allowed to go and help. Eight years old, I was so proud, it was really good. They kitted me out, they put, I, I had to wear the company uniform, so I had this massive orange polo shirt. It was, it was kind of huge, really, really big. And back then, this big brown warehouse coat that people used to wear in these kind of shops. I was just, it was just huge. And I was in this tile store, which was next to the wheelhouse. So the old water wheel that ran the mill. It was stone cold because the building was made of stone. It was December, snow on the ground. I was having a brilliant time. So absolutely loving it because all I was doing, I was talking to people. I was helping them choose these tiles, put them in a box, um, write a little thing out, say what they'd got. They went, they paid. It was just, it was so cool. I earned a commission, first commission, when I was eight years old. I invested it wisely. Little prize in chat, if anyone can guess what I invested my first commission in. Let's see if you've worked out what kind of person I am. What would I have invested my first commission in when I was eight years old? Let's see if anybody can guess that. A book, ice cream, toys, yeah. <laughs> Baron, I would love to think that I'd have done that then. I think ice cream and toys are far closer. It was sweets as it happened. Lots of sweeties. Um, but look, this is where I started the love affair for sales. I, I love sales. I love salespeople. I love working in sales and helping people to get better. I have a growth mindset. I always want to get better. I'm always learning. Funny enough, now I would buy a book. Yeah, so now I'd probably write a book. Um, but I, other people who've got growth mindset, I can totally connect with, I work with, I love working with them. And look, a bit of a confession here as a trainer, I struggle with people that have a fixed mindset that don't want to get better, that don't want to grow, that think, no, I'm doing, working like this, I've got my way, it's perfect. Things are changing so fast that it doesn't make any sense to me, so I do struggle. So I do get quite picky with, uh, with who I work with, which is... <laughs> I'm fortunate enough to do now. Another thing I think is that everybody is in sales. You know, I've seen a couple of people who've jumped on here. There's a GM, there's entrepreneurs. But if you think about every profession has some element of sales. I believe sales skills are life skills. So I actually invest some of my time or use some of my time to work with a local university to help the students there. Because it, it annoys me that business study degrees don't often teach people in sales. So I'll give my time to do that. Um, but no, for me, sales... It's, it's a wonderful profession. It's something that we can all really invest in. And my, my mantra, you probably hear me say this a number of times, is that I want to help good people, good salespeople, do good things in a good way. That's what selling is all about for me. However, sales has evolved. So I think this starts to answer some of the questions I was seeing in chat. Sales has evolved. And there's a danger as a professional salesperson that we don't keep up. Salespeople need to keep up. We need to take the things that really work. We need to use these, keep using them. And the things that don't work, we need to throw away as far as possible. They will do us damage, cause problems with relationships with customers. So part of what I do is I, 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 I like history. So I like to look at the evolution of sales and then take some of the things that are working. So what I'm gonna do, we'll do a quick spin through the evolution of sales. And I'm doing this because then we can say, right, this is useful for us now. This is useful for us now. This is useful for us now. This is essentially what I do in the training, one part of it. Now, I'm going to go back to the 50s. I'm not going to go way, way back. Um, but so 50s, re reasonably modern history, we can look at what was going on. And again, as, as, a, bit of a, as a bit of a geek when it comes to this sort of stuff, I, I love how selling reflected what was important at the, at the, at the time, important in the era. So if we think six, uh, 50s, post-war, 
regeneration. It was all about getting more effective, better at what we're doing. And this was exactly what sales was about. Sales was all about having good process, a good solid system, a good methodology of way of doing the things that work time and time again. Which, if you think about it, makes absolute sense now. Yeah, I'd still use that. I still coach sales process and I give people frameworks to work in. That's something that we need to do. If not, and we're making things up as we go along. That's where we get into the busy, 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 wasteful type space. If we look in the 60s, I always think of 60s, this kind of psychedelia era. But there's this fascination with the brain, the mind, you know, how, how we thought, what we did. And actually, a lot of sales training reflected this. There's a lot of training around the psychology of sales, why people do what they do, why people think like they think. And so we encourage salespeople to recognize that and be able to adapt to the way in which somebody's thinking. I think straight after this, Mads is doing a whole, a whole thing on the neuroscience of selling, which has come on so much from the 60s. We still tap into this, but we can really understand the brain, how it works, important part of when we're communicating with people. Yeah, I will go back to the 70s still, and kind of the 70s, it reestablished some fundamentals in selling. And for me, 70s was about benefit selling, selling benefits. Customers have this question, but they don't ask us it. And the question they ask is, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? So what? If we don't explain this to people, it makes it harder for them to make decisions. So again, good salespeople are very clear about why somebody would want to invest with them, why what they sell helps somebody do something. We need to reinforce it. So um, in the 80s, in the 80s, this is where I look at things and think, oh, yes, it's an interesting decade, interesting decade here. Um, because this is when I saw a couple of comments in chat about what the bad practices were. This is where a lot of the bad practices were, were, were pushed forward. This is for me, I always think of the era of like greed is good. Wolf, uh, the, the Gordon Gecko on Wall Street. Um, ABC, always be closing, again, Gary, again, Ross. The closers that were trained were just weird bit manipulative, try to force pressure customers. We do not want to do that. They're the things we need to lose totally. The one thing we can take, or a thing we can take, is that sales is, though, a series of advancements. We need to get customer commitment to move to different set parts of the sale. And the more complex, the more sophisticated the sale. Uh, and, and Musa, yes, I'm talking B2B here. B2B complex sales is the area that I specialize in. That's got lots of moving parts. Lots of people are working within the decision-making unit. So we need to be understanding all of these people and keeping the momentum moving forward. So advancements, that is okay for me from the 80s. But anyway, our focus should be into stuff that came to sales from the 90s. 90s, sea change in selling. And the sea change isn't like the sea that the fish swim in, it's the sea for consultative consultative selling. That was a big, big development in sales. Neil Rackham and his team, they looked at what was going on in sales, the best salespeople, what were they doing? Why were they so effective? And they found that actually they weren't doing what they were trained to do, which is these closing techniques. They were actually asking the customers more questions. They were asking them questions to understand better, but also to help the customer understand better. They were establishing that where somebody is now isn't necessarily where they want to be, and then by understanding that more, creating more of a gap, more of a difference between those positions, they were able to help customers focus on need. That is a foundational way that anybody operating today would want to work. However, 30, 40 years old, what we need to do is add in some of the other elements that have since um, been invoked. So in the noughties, we added in this layer of thinking about the value a customer would want to achieve. We talk about value selling, understanding what it is with the customer, positioning that, proving that, showing them that this is something that makes sense for them, their business. Integral parts of trading we would do today. In the tens, so I've been trading in the noughties and tens. In the tens, I was talking to salespeople about developing a sales stature, having the right sales stature, <laughs> being the person that was considered the go-to in their business. Yeah, they understand things. Um, and they're able to help customers. They have that reputation. Now we would talk about personal brand. <laughs> so it's all about your personal branding. Uh, back then, you know, the, the uh, social media was just really starting to take off. Now, so personal branding is important for salespeople. Yeah, part and parcel. 
And some of the tools that it affords us are also important. The twenties though, so where we are now, uh, for me, this is all about consultative, uh, about collaborative selling. This is the point, collaborative selling. We can take some of these things and we can be way more collaborative in the way we work with customers. We co-create, we understand value, we work on things together. We take far more of a partnership approach, use partnering skills. Whether it's a formal partnering or not, we can still use the ethos to get better at this. So that is where selling is today. Yeah, we've had some big changes right at the beginning of the decade. I think it only consolidates this. It only makes this collaborative approach and working with people even more important than ever. It's sped up the process. The evolution of sales has sped up because of, because of COVID, because of, of the things that have happened. Um, that's, why I, that's why I've written another book. That's out next year. I wrote one book. There we go. And COVID hit. So there's been some changes. And so a new book I'll hopefully be able to talk to you all about uh, pretty soon. However, let's focus on collaborative selling. This is what this session is all about. Um, we want to be working together, co-create, add value. And then so I have this mantra, which is about think, learn, do. And that's the way I operate. I can do a lot of the thinking for you. Okay, put it in the book. It's there. There are ways in which we can approach this. Brindis, it's, it's a learning organization. We, we train and we can put the package, the ideas in a way, and I like to think a very novel way to help people understand stuff quicker. However, it's all about doing. But even that, we'll encourage people to do things in a, in a certain way. So think, learn, do. Really, really important way of applying some of the modern thinking. Yeah. It's implementation, not just information. That's another key little mantra I have. So to do this, we need to take the sales stuff that's still relevant and still works, and then to adapt this collaborative mindset, we want to bring in this thing called PQ. So let me just ask in chat, PQ, has anybody come across PQ? Just give me a little Y or M, yes or no. Yes or no, you know what PQ is. No, nope, I've got one no there. Maybe. <laughs> well, it's very evasive, Baron. <laughs> I know the word P, I know the word Q, I just don't know what the context they're in, maybe. Okay, let me ask another question then. IQ and EQ, have people come across that or those concepts? IQ and EQ, yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. I would expect, I'd expect a group like this to have done that. Yeah, so IQ and EQ, intelligent quotient, um, which classically was what people thought how intelligent you were. Yeah, they missed all the emotional intelligence, which is what EQ is. Think of PQ, performance quotient would be good. Partnership quotient, yeah. Partnering quotient, partnering skills. Something I came across a few years ago now, um, which is, it's almost like the lesser known cousin of IQ and EQ. It was developed and understood around the same time as EQ by a guy called Steve Dent. He was looking at very kind of formal business alliances and how they could work better together. You know, the kind of things when the airlines were coming together and building these like big, big alliances because it would just work better. They wanted to do it be you know, best they possibly could. And so they asked him, you know, how can we do this better? And he went, did the research, came back. And to keep the story short, he said, well, it's not about organizations. Organizations don't partner. People do. These are people skills. And he understood the six elements that PQ, that partnering skills has. I looked at these and I thought, actually, this isn't just people working in business alliance. Every single salesperson should use these to become their guiding ethos. If you can bake these into the way you sell, you will be a more effective salesperson. And so I'll share these with you and you can say whether I'm mad or whether I'm 100% correct. Yeah, I think it'd be hard to challenge that these aren't something that every salesperson would, would want to understand. But you can tell me. So these are skills. They're things that we can measure. They're things that we can develop. And then we can bring them very deliberately and consciously into how we work. There are six of them. I have to go through um, sequentially. Um, but imagine they do all work together. So Imran, I'm going to make sure that we can see all these nice and clearly. I'll explain them a little bit. The first is trust. And I actually, even though it's not sequential, I will, 
I always talk about this first um, because trust is the foundation to relationships. Trust is key. Trust is about helps us communicate better. We can be deliberate in building trust. That's a building trust. Think about what we say, what we do. You know, are we credible? Do we know our stuff? Do we say, do we do what we say we're going to do? Do we do things with other people's best intent? Are we doing things for them rather than for us? That's kind of one of the major trust builders that we can concentrate on. We do a whole training just on trust, but it's an important part of PQ, partnering skills. The, another element of partnering skills is having a win-win focus. Again, I looked at the titles you, you were giving me in the chat, lots of salespeople on this. Win-win would not really be a, a surprise to you guys. You know, we've got to balance up that we get something out of a deal, so does a customer. Lose, win, win, lose, never works. It's not sustainable. So understanding people's expectations, what they need from a, from a deal, what makes sense to them, make sure the outcomes are understood and ours are shared, makes a lot of sense. It informs how we negotiate, how we discuss things. It's just a key key element, as in any relationship. We need to be comfortable with interdependence, interdependence. The lone wolf, independent, off they go on their own salesperson is not effective or not the most effective. In modern selling, in bigger sales, in B2B, complex selling, there'll be a lot of people involved. So there's the, sale, well, the salesperson's own team, the sale customer's team. But even if you break it down into my success as a salesperson is subject to your success as a customer, that's why we need to have an understanding of what interdependence looks like. And in some ways, be comfortable giving up a bit of control. Number four, the one, an extra element of this is transparency. So I use that word now. Steve so Dent talked about self-disclosure and feedback, which is really what transparency is for me. It's giving information about myself. It's giving stuff that people aren't necessarily going to find out. They wouldn't know. I've got to share that. I can't expect the customer to be a mind reader. But equally, I want to talk to the customer about what blind spots they have. I need to give them some feedback. And this is an area that some salespeople struggle with. They think, oh, I can't tell a sales, I can't give, I can't say talk like that to a customer. If a customer has agreed to do things in a certain way, and that's part of the deal, that's how we're going to work together, and they don't hold up their part of the bargain, we have to let people know this. It is part of the job now. There's an important way in which we need to think about how can we operate like this. We need to be comfortable with change. Salespeople, we sell change. And we challenge the status quo. Uh, change is usually, or status quo is usually our biggest competitor. So we need to understand what change is, how it affects people, the process, the cycles they go through. How can we help people with that? And we need to be comfortable on it ourselves. Because otherwise, what right have we got to talk to people about it? So comfort with change is another key element. And the sixth element of PQ, of partnering skills, is to have this future orientation, this future focus. Think about what's the shared vision we have with customers? Where are we going today? Let's focus on that. Let's make decisions based on traveling towards. I'm not saying we completely ignore the past, but decisions made purely on the past will not be as effective when we're in the sales mode as when we're thinking about where we're trying to, uh, where we're trying to go. So these elements of PQ are things which we can very deliberately understand and bake in, we can use in the way that we sell. Sales on one hand, PQ on the other hand, bring these together. That's how we can be way more collaborative in our approach. Far more effective salesperson today because it involves the way in which customers need to work today and how we can bring that to the party. So the way that I help people do this, and I'll take you very briefly through the framework because the, the idea of this for me is to kind of give as many little tips as I can give to people so the session is valuable and to give you a bit of a sense of understanding of how I operate and then tell you where there's more information, is I use the value framework. As a framework, these are different ways in which we can focus on parts of the cell that if we bring our PQ and the best sales practice, we can be way, way more effective. This is all about having a steep learning curve. And I always smile because people often talk about a steep learning curve as though it's a bad thing. Oh, that's a steep learning curve. Brilliant. Steep learning curve is brilliant. It means that you're delivering performance faster. Ideally, it's also smoother as well. 
So if we can deliver a steep learning curve for people, we're doing our job well. Trainers, managers, sales leaders, that's what we want to try to do as a salesperson. Yes, you want to challenge yourself to have a steep learning curve. So how does a value framework help us with this? Helps us focus on some different parts. The V is to validate. Validate. This is about working on the right opportunities. It's validating them. In old-fashioned language, it's about qualifying. Now, the word qualify, I struggle with a little bit because it sounds a little bit self-centered. It's a bit old-fashioned. It's like, oh, are they good enough for me to work with? Do they qualify for my time and attention? Yes, there is part of that. However, we also want to be looking and thinking, well, how are they going to work back? Can we really add value there? And what's their response? Because if I'm going with a partnering ethos, partnering mindset, it takes two to tango. To do that dance, both parties need to be involved. So we need to think about, does that partner, does that potential customer look as though they're the right kind of people for us to work with? When we're picking the right opportunities, we can then align far better. Alignment is about doing homework, doing your homework. Again, B2B, complex sales. There's lots of working parts. There's lots of potential for adding value. There's more people involved. So a good salesperson starts to work this out. They start to think about, okay, this is potentially what I can do, where I can add value, where we can make a difference for them, where I'm going to have maximum impact. It's where I've done this kind of thing before. And then just start to formulate the plan to think about, okay, so how am I going to have intelligent conversations? How can I leverage this information? How can I leverage this so that now we're discussing ways in which we can operate together with all the relevant parties? Still, I think too many salespeople don't have enough contacts. They talk with one person, their, their, their champion, which is often badly defined, or the person they just seem to get on with better. They don't have enough conversations leveraging the information of things that they can do well. If we're leveraging this position, if we're having discussions, if we're exploring things, if we're working out where we can co-create, where we can add value, puts us in this position that we're able to underpin, we can underpin our offer, underpin, support, back up. Like a three-legged stool, think of the, the different legs. If we're missing a part of it, the stool tips over. I like the concept of the three-legged stool because it helps me think about resonate, differentiate, substantiate resonate it's about being on the same wavelength as the customer being in harmony with them working with them in a way that makes sense that they get they understand that's the salesperson's job we then need to substantiate we need to prove that we need to back it up case studies testimonials return on investment anything that proves to the customer it's the best way for them to work helps them feel less risk more comfortable in moving ahead, making the advancements that we talked about earlier. Then we need to differentiate. As I often say to people on training, being different is not a differentiator in itself. Just being different is irrelevant. It has to be relevant to the customer. It's got to be important to them. It's got to mean something. So we look for the differentiator where we can say yes, this is where we do things. We have got a slightly different way of operating, but this is why it makes sense to you. Resonate, differentiate, substantiate. If we're not doing those, the stool will tip over. It won't be stable. If we get a stable stool, if we advance, if we move forward, we can then evolve the relationship. We can move it forward. We can make it better. We can grow the business together. I get, that's a different, <laughs> it's a different presentation, but I sometimes get... <sighs> I don't know, annoyed, I suppose, about this fascination lots of companies have with new logos. New, 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 new. Get a new customer, right, got them, on to the next. What about growing with people that we've already got the relationships, we're already delivering value, we can scope the opportunity to, to do even more. Makes more sense, it's easier, it's cheaper. So we want to think about how we can very deliberately do that. The Evolve framework gives us a way just to hang around all these correct behaviors and ways of operating. I say brings the good sales techniques relevant today with PQ, which gives us a partnering mindset, brings it together. That's how we're going to become more modern salesperson. So my next question then is, is this you? Is this you? It's not everybody. And that's okay. 
some people may well be listening to what I'm saying and thinking the guy's crazy. The guy's nuts. That's not how it works. Okay, fine. <laughs> we differ in opinion. Some people might be thinking, spot on. Absolutely, you have described what I do and want to do better or what I want to do. And that's brilliant as well. Yeah. So I can share things and I can help people. I encourage people to work like this because I really believe it works. That's why I put pen to paper. Um, but you know, you've got to make up your own mind. Vanilla ice. Okay, I'm talking a lot. Pop something in chat while I have a quick glass of water. Vanilla ice. If you know him, <laughs> what is his most famous song? Vanilla ice. It's a cultural test. <laughs> it's a cultural test in any country. <laughs> JD wants a handout with vanilla ice on. That's on my Instagram. That, that slide is on my Instagram. And I'll, 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 okay, I'll tell you why I've put a photo of vanilla ice. And Ice Ice Baby absolutely is the song. Yeah, in, in the song, Ice Ice Baby, he actually says, stop, collaborate, and listen. And I asked the person who helps me with social media to prepare the slide saying, stop, listen, collaborate. She said, no, that's the wrong words. So no, it's the right words. She said, no, no, it's wrong. I said, no, look, I, I know the words. I actually sang it at my own wedding. A bit embarrassing, but anyway. Um, I said, but in this instance, I'm using this slide because I want people to think, stop. Take a moment, listen to yourself, listen to your heart, and decide whether this stuff makes sense for you. If it does, and if you believe collaboration is the way ahead, then I am here to help. I, I, I've got loads of stuff out there which will help you to do this. Yeah, I, 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 wanna, I, I wanna do this stuff. That's why I wrote the book, Selling Through Partner Skills. The information is in there. The framework, PQ, an explanation of those, a way to do the test, it's, it's all in the book there. If you like podcasts, I do a regular podcast. So I talk to sales people, sales leaders, other trainers, experts, people from different parts of the industry as well, about how they use PQ. Yeah, I, um, I also, talk, I've got some very specific uh, episodes in there. There's, there's lots of things happening in sales, really interesting uh, evolutions. Using video in sales, I mean, that's really big. So I've interviewed a couple of people just about that. Producing content, I've interviewed a couple of people just about that. Mutual action plans, yeah, mutual action plans as a way, outcome enablement plans, ways in which we can partner. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Musa, partnering with customers. Or if not a formal partnership, like I say, it's the partnering mindset. Think of them as a partner, even if there isn't a formal alliance. If you operate like that, you do a better sales job. That's what we talk about on the podcast a lot. Some really, really interesting uh, discussions with some interesting guys on there. PQ audit. So again, that's in the book. Uh, if you connect with me and I'll show you connections, uh, I, can, I can point you towards where there's a way to do that audit online. You, just, you need to put an email in, but then it'll give you a report back so you can work out what your spider diagram looks like. Um, Rocky. Rocky is a superb app. Rocky Robot. So, um, so Rocky Robot, this is an AI chatbot. So lots of you probably use AI already, except you probably ask it questions. Siri, what is the capital of France? Paris, okay. Rocky is the opposite way around. Rocky asks you questions. Rocky's a coach. Rocky's a coach you can have in your pocket 24 seven. I use Rocky every day. Yeah, I speak to him <laughs> in my head um, by text, but I actually can talk to Rocky now. And so by asking questions, Rocky helps you reflect. Rocky helps you think. So first thing in the morning, I grab my phone. I know people say that's bad practice, it is if you start looking at Facebook and things, but if you start talking to a coach to get the day set up, it makes a lot of sense. End of the day, as I'm winding down, as I'm turning off from work, I then reflect on it with Rocky by the questions he, okay, I probably personalized it a bit too much, asks. It uses AI to ask a question that's right. With Rocky's got an infinite number of questions. It's very, very cool. So as I say to people, because he's my friend now, Rocky has read my book. So actually you can, you can take a growth path which talks about collaborative selling. I use this in the training. I put package in as part of what I do. But what I say to people is like, it might not be the collaborative selling piece you need at a time. It could be a piece about wellness. Uh, it could be about purpose. It could be about discipline. 
It could be about uh, a number of the different growth paths that Rocky's got in there that will take you through and daily reflection and mindset will help you with. Um, the collaborative selling scorecard. OK, so I'm actually going to pop this into chat now. This is something that I use in training, but also I love sharing with people because it helps you by again asking questions it helps you reflect on how you are selling now uh, there's a bunch of quick fire questions a couple of sliding questions sliding scale questions and what it do it'll produce you a report using dynamic content that will tell you about how you're operating now in relation to a collaborative self so it uses the value framework checks a bit of pq and checks something around values as well it takes about five minutes to do um, but if you take longer to do it and really reflect on the question, think about it, it will give you more of an insight into what collaborative selling is all about. There'll be things which hopefully as a sales professional, you'll be able to pick up on and say, ah, OK, yes, this has helped me work out what I can do differently. So I, I'd, I'd encourage you to have a look at that. I would encourage you to have a look at that. Um, so I'll just pop that in chat. Uh, if not, connect with me. Please connect with me. With my name, I can have it on all the social media I want. <laughs> Nobody else has tried to get Fred Cope steak. Quite a unique name. So uh, I think I'm probably connected with quite a few of you on LinkedIn. I do recognize some names. It's good to see you here. If not, please connect with me on there, Fred Cope steak. Facebook, yeah. Instagram, if you like pictures, we're generally putting stuff on there, visual stuff. Twitter, I'll put things on there. And YouTube, I'm building the channel out. If you want to, if you want to subscribe to YouTube channel, that'd be cool because I, I need to change the name. It's quite new. I've put a lot of content on there, but I really need to give a push on that. All part of my own evolution to, to help people. Yeah. Because I'll, 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 be, I'll be transparent. I've talked about transparency. Yeah. I've got to practice what I preach. Yeah. I want to be known as the guy that brings partnering skills to professional selling. Yeah. Um, I want to bring partnering skills to professional sales. That's, that's, my, that's my goal. You know, that, that's why I've written the book. That's why I do the stuff I do. That's why I build the accelerator and the way in which we train. So look, if I can help you with any of your thinking, please get in touch. I want people to be proud about being a salesperson. I want to be proud about it. Sometimes we have this stigma attached to sales. It's considered a bit, a bit yucky, a bit icky, a bit. No, it shouldn't be. We do a good job. Ultimately, for me, it is about having good salespeople doing good things in good ways. We can use sales as a force for good without a shadow of a doubt by operating correctly. The partnering mindset, considering our customs as partners and how we work as a result of that is for me the step to start to achieve that. So that's where I wanted to get to today. I wanted to just leave a couple of, um, couple of minutes for questions. And it looks as though I've got uh, I've got stuff in here. So I'll be sending a presentation. Yeah, we can send uh, copies of the slides. There are many pictures, but that's fine. Uh, I think we're going to send or we'll get access to the recording. I'm pretty sure we're going to do that if Varun or Nida or yeah, Varun is nodding. So we're going to do that. Uh, I'll send a copy of the scorecard in there as well, or the link to the scorecard. Um, and as sales leaders, there's a lot of sales leaders on here. I'm going to make you a special offer on that as well. Um, I haven't decided what it is yet, but I'm going to commit to do it now. It'll be along the lines of if you sign people up to an accelerator that I'm running, so I'm going to run one specifically for the Middle East, then I will do something special just for the sales leaders so you can make the most of it and coach it better. There you go. I've just talked myself into that. I worked out exactly what it'll look like, but there you go. Make commitments to people. More likely for stuff to happen. <laughs> Right. OK. Uh, what about handling objections, handling rejections? OK, so I think that maybe um, I'll try and interpret the question. Um, so for me, the whole part of the point of becoming better at partnering is that and a more modern sales approach is that because we're making these series of advancements and we're working forward with this kind of mindset it makes more sense for us to work together we're less likely to have the objection we're less likely to have it when we look at objection handling and you look at some training and it'll kind of have that as a little module little section 
for me, that feels a little bit 80s. It's like kind of, oh, I need to understand the objection. Now I'm going to batter it away. Objection, batter it away. Objection, batter it away. It's like kind of trying to do judo with the, with the customer. MMA, try and beat them up. If we're working all the way forwards, understanding what's important to people, we can do this, we can adapt, we can work together, we're less likely to have that. And part of the value framework is V for Validate. It's actually, does it make sense for us to be working together in the first place? Not everybody's a potential customer. I've kind of intimated that in my own presentation. I said, look, I don't get some people who've got this fixed mindset. I can't really work with them. Don't want to actually. In the pointy slide, <laughs> it's like, yeah, is this you? If it's you, brilliant. If it's not you, okay, I'm not going to try and change your mind. I'll give you information. If it does change your mind, happy days. Because there's enough people who will want to work with me, same as all of you guys. You know, I think that's a bit of a shift in sales, really picking the people we can do best with. I hope I interpreted that question correctly. <laughs> um, so what else we got in there? Okay, events, AI to understand customers. Somebody asked a question earlier on, actually I'm going back now, talk about one of the things that's changing sales, tech, <laughs> big time. I alluded to it as well. So, you know, using video in sales, you know, a lot of people feel uncomfortable with it. And I'm talking not just synchronous, so the stuff we would do is a video call where we can see people, we can read them. I think Mads will be talking pretty much about that with the neuroscience stuff, pretty sure. Um, but even sending video, sending video, what a brilliant way to build relationships. We're not doing that, we're missing a trick. Again, okay, there's a couple of really good podcasts. Great thing about having podcasts is it's easy to talk to the people who write books. <laughs> they'll come and tell you what's in the book. If you're to read a book, they'll, they'll jump on a podcast, I'll tell you that for free. <laughs> um, Cool. So we send presentation and handling rejections, uh, partnering with a reseller. I, so I mean everything. I mean everything. Who's that? Who asked that? Uh, Musa. I mean everything. Um, actually, when I started on the journey of understanding partnering skills, it was because I was doing a lot of work in channel. I, you know, working with a lot of like IT resellers um, on behalf of the vendors, and we're looking at partnering and the partnering skills to help that. But as I looked at it, I realized it's not just channel. Yes, it has a huge amount of impact on channel. You know, call someone a partner, please act like it. <laughs> I could open up a right can of worms in IT channels and <laughs> whether they do do that or not always. Um, so yes, 100% relevant to that. But I took it and went, it's relevant to every salesperson. So I opened it, I opened it up further. And that's that's kind of you know, a bit of the, the evolution of writing the book and understanding it. Again, hopefully that, that makes sense. So if, if, that's, if that's your area, Again, grab a book, look at some of the resources I've, I've given there, and you'll, it'll make sense to you. Uh, how can this coaching apply to the team rather than individual? Um, so again, if we go back to what the challenges of selling were in the model mindset uh, as a team, as a team leader, as a sales leader, to equip the team to think like this, I think is one of the greatest gifts and one of the best ways in which you can start to develop the team and start to have an impact on targets. Um, and then as the, as the sales leader, it's to do everything you can to enable that. You know, set up all the support, set up the every piece of enablement to encourage people to work in this way. Yeah, Help them to think more about partnering. Have these team discussions around that. Yeah, and One of the things I do when I break the training down, we break it into, a lot, into smaller sections, on the beauties of virtual, is the beginning of every section, we talk about the partnering skills. So there's six virtual models module, but we talk about one of those in each time. Just having that discussion just around partnering, just about how you apply that in your own context with the team will open up ideas. It's amazing how many ideas people have with partnering. I've done nearly 100 podcasts asking people about how they do this and so many different ideas and what those different elements are and how they can be applied. So as a sales leader, use it to use it coach the team. I hope that helps. So yeah, it gives you, it gives you the framework and the framework, you know, the value and the bits which go in there because I've not gone right down into the detail of the actual tactics and the techniques like mapping a decision-making unit, like writing a mutual action plan, like writing a proposal. They're all tactical elements that a good sales leader will help people to understand how to do. Sometimes, sometimes salespeople just don't know how to do some of these basics, the fundamentals. 
Boom, handling rejection. So again, I think the handling rejection stuff or handling object, I, I said objections. Again, I hope I'm interpreting it the right way. Pick me up if I'm not. Um, I think, again, without being too repetitive, for me, it's about, it's about doing the right things which move the relationship forward, which keep the sale on track because we are genuinely adding value. People want to work with you because they understand it resonate it makes sense to me you've explained to me why i can see what benefit i'm getting i can understand the value substantiate it's backed up there's proof there you've told me case studies you've given me stories there's testimonials there's other customers who are talking about it yeah and differentiate i can see the way you do it is different enough to set you apart and make me want to work with you so for me I concentrate way less on objection handling techniques now, because again, I think it's a bit old fashioned to just go, let's run straight to the end and then just spend a lot of time pushing down person. If we work better earlier on, we can align things and we package stuff in a way which makes far more sense to people. So it should become easier. Doesn't mean that people don't have objections, or rejection. I, again, if I'm interpreting it right, um, so the, the, the phrase I use is don't use the word objection. It's not helpful. Concern. Someone's got a concern. They're not quite sure. They've, maybe you've not done a job well. And I love this little phrase. It's like treat concerns with concern. Take them seriously. That is real for somebody. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt are big showstoppers. Uh, so if anyone's been around a little bit, they might remember that from the old uh, IBM. Nobody got fired for buying IBM. Why? Because they will say that. <laughs> because they want people to think, well, oh, that other option's a bit, a bit new, a bit, I'm a bit, a bit worried about it. Oh, I'm not quite so sure about doing something different. I don't believe you. That's why we resonate, substantiate, differentiate. Um, now, if I've misunderstood rejection and you're talking, talking earlier in the sales cycle, that some people will not want to work with you, fine. That's okay. Yeah. How to qualify a client. Okay, so great question. So yes, I, 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 was, I was answering at the wrong end of the sales cycle. Let's answer earlier on. So how do I, how do I qualify a client? Okay, so um, I, in the book, so there's, there's different ways. You know, there's a very, very basic way, BANT, budget authority need timescale. For me, that's a little bit too self-centered. It's a good starting point, but I took in the book about Scotsman. Again, it's an acronym which gets to think about the solution. So are people buying the full solution, potential solution, which makes sense to, to work with me? Competition. Are they working with people or would work with somebody similar to me? Are they so tight to them? Actually, I'm never going to change them. Yeah. Um, are they, is there an opportunity to do something quite original? So actually, if I can innovate with people, if I can work better with them, fantastic, because that's going to start to set me apart. The differentiators will be start to become relevant. Um, SCO. Scott, T, time. When are they looking to do this? Uh, if I'm too late, if I can't do anything within the time frame they've got, again, it's not an opportunity, if it's so far down the line, actually, yeah, I do have sales targets. Money. Again, you know, we are commercial. It's all very well doing stuff with pure customer intent, but we need to move things forward. Um, do I understand how decisions are made? Are made? Um, and, uh, you know, need. Ultimately, do they really need whether they understand, you know, they might not understand it, and that's the job as a salesperson to do that. So that's what Scotsman helps us to do. But I'll look at this psychological thing as well. Like, how do they work with people? Are they potential people who would want to respond well to good partnering? Yeah. So Bant isn't dead as such. I just think it's a little bit too simple. It's, it's a starting point, you know, but it's again, it's self centered. I think if we're serious about partnering with people, we want to understand more and qualify and validate. That's why, again, I use that word slightly differently, a little bit better. Yeah. So not totally dead, but if that's the only thing you do, I think it's a bit, you're probably not doing yourself a good enough favor. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So, uh, bring this site is, yeah. <laughs> I need a better hosting partner. I will sort that straight away. Thank you for pointing out. And so again, hopefully that answers about the working with the right kind of people. And say so if we get rejected, okay, but we're not going to work with everyone. I said it earlier, you know, for me, that's fine. Okay, There's, there'll be enough people out there. 
um, which yeah, sounds easy enough to say, but again, once adapting that mindset, it does, it does help. And we start looking for the people who are more likely to want to work with us. These are great questions. I do have an eye on the clock. I'll talk about this stuff all day, as you could probably imagine. <laughs> Absolutely will. Um, Batner, our Batner's negotiation. Best alternative to negotiated agreement. Absolutely. I was training that last week and I was trying to get the people to really understand where it is that they have to walk away. Yeah, it's all the qualification Batner, I guess. That tends to be a bit later in the process for me. Cool. Any other questions? We've got another couple of minutes. How to handle a client who had some bad experience with a competitor? Okay, so again, I would I would tread with care around this. Yeah, I wouldn't be going and going, yeah, they're rubbish, aren't they? God, what idiot chose to work with them? Uh, it was me. And I feel bad enough that I made a bad mistake. Don't make me feel any worse. Yeah. Um, but I would, again, if in doubt, I go to questions. Tell me about the things that made the experience bad. Explain to me what happened. Describe the circumstances and what it is that's making your experience bad. Ted, tell, explain, describe. They're just different ways of asking questions. Really understanding what's made it bad because then it's, okay, I need to make sure that I'm not going to do something similar. Yeah. And also I want to then demonstrate, so I want to back up and show that the way I work will not let that happen again. If we can try to fix it for them, great. You know, that's an, that's an opportunity. Um, but again, I'd start to go, go back to the partnering skills. I'd go future focused and go, okay, what is it you're trying to achieve? Where do you want to be? So understood what the problem is, what's made it like that. Don't beat up the competition. Don't beat up the, the customer. It's too easy to say, oh, well, you know, stupid decision. Should have come with me in the first place. That's not good. Um, but then we can um, start to think about, okay, so where do we need to be? What is good, good going to look like? If we were working, there's no good questions, this is a hypothetical high gain question. If we were working together in three years time and you were saying, this is the best experience I've ever had, what would we have done? Again, I'd always get salespeople to be asking more questions, understanding stuff better. What does the win look like for them? Win, win. Yeah. Cool. So anything else that people like to I say, we will send the email out. The scorecard is in there. The scorecard I offer implementation calls. If people think this sounds like sort of stuff to me, um, yeah, I can. Um, then, uh, you know, jump on that. I will, I will jump on a call individually with you. Yeah, so. So Musa, just imagine if we were working together in three years time and you were saying, this is some of the best training I've had or the best customer experience I had, or it's just been a brilliant relationship. What is it that I would have done? If we were working together in three years time and you were saying it was fantastic, what is it I would have done? So the question is hypothetical, if, yeah, we've gone future, I'm asking people to think a bit big picture. It's not real, we just, in the chat here but it's just helping me say okay right good well you know you said those things that is how we operate that thing isn't what we do but we can certainly make it happen yeah let's start to build what we can do together around that that's why it's such a powerful question get people to daydream a little bit if i was harry potter you all know harry potter yeah the wizard and i could wave my magic wand and make stuff happen what would you want that to be another way to get people really thinking out loud and then we can start to use that and become a little bit more practical with it. Cool. Anything else? I appreciate if people want to jump off this. I think there's another call, uh, another thing straight after. I will happily answer questions all day. Remember it's early for me, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay, so I don't. I don't want to. I, I would be annoyed if um, uh, I was. I was talking about someone else's thing. So, I, I, Alvin, am I right? Is it Mads who's talking now? Is he talking today or tomorrow? 
don't know if he can jump off and probably there. He'll get right into the mindset. But look, please, please use the resources I'm putting out there. That, that's my job. So I told you, I want to be famous for bringing this stuff to the world of sales. I'm putting things out. Let me know. Can you give me feedback? And I've told you, self disclosure and feedback. I want feedback as well, whether, it, whether it's resonating with you guys, what else I can do. If you want to work with me, again, I would love to do that. I love working in the Middle East. It's good fun. And a lot of stuff I do virtually now anyway, so it's very, very easy. We're going to send some details around that. So, look, I, I do appreciate everyone jumping on now. Um, I hope you have a brilliant week. Do I play what I play? Yeah, I, I certainly try to, Musa. I certainly try to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it would be wrong for me not to. No, I do. I, I, I do because I'm selective about who I work with for a start. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I try and I'm always learning, always wanting feedback. Yeah. So, Cool. Brilliant questions, guys. Thank you for taking the time. As I say, I am available. Um, we're going to send those emails out. Again, I think pretty much we'll do those today. Um, uh, thank you. All the best to everyone, absolutely. Have a great week. I am actually going to sign off now. Um, so, yeah. I, again, I'm available. I'm signing off now, but, you know, I'm here. I'm, I'm around. I'm on these channels. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll very happily talk to anybody about this stuff. Let's make a difference. Good people doing good things in a good way. That's what we're all aspiring to do. Take care, everyone.